Afternoon, everybody. And now you've been introduced to your neighbour. If you see they're falling asleep after lunch, please just poke them in the ribs. So my question to you would be this. Which is, what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? Is it that smell of bacon and eggs wafting up the stairs? Or if you're in California, then knowing that your fresh berries and yogurt are sitting waiting downstairs for you? Or is it something else? There are three things that get me out of bed in the morning. And to each of them, I believe there is a technological solution. <laughs> Quite honestly, the first thing that gets me out of bed every single day is my teenage daughter, because she cannot find a matching pair of socks to get to school. There is a company to be invented here, and I would be a willing investor in it. But the really big things that get me out of bed and have done for the last 10 years are big numbers and a concern about the dominant paradigm of healthcare. And in both of those cases, in the cases of the big numbers that seem to represent intractable social problems, and in the case of a, a dominant paradigm of healthcare that focuses on illness rather than healthy behaviours, technology has a huge transformative role. Ten years ago, in 2006, 2007, there were some big numbers that really, really bothered me. Let me just share three of those. One is that there was this prevalent understanding that I still, I really don't get, I don't understand it, that says one in four people experience poor mental health during their lifetime. And I kind of always said, and I've, who would dare say that one in four people experience poor physical health during their lifetime? You would actually be laughed at. We all have mental health as we have physical health. Just like you can have everything from a common cold through to a terminal illness. You can have everything from low-level stress through to a severe and enduring mental illness. And actually, physical and mental are highly interconnected. So let's bust that statistic, which I actually find more stigmatizing than many other aspects of mental health care. Another statistic that bothered me is not only is there a huge prevalence of poor mental health, that 75% of people in higher-income countries, let alone those in lower-income countries, get no treatment whatsoever. 75%. And then there was a figure that I thought I could do something about, which is that 50% of people, a half of people with a diagnosable mental health problem, commonly anxiety and depression, don't even get as far as their primary care doctor when they're going having an experience of poor mental health. So that's an area I thought, OK, we can do something here. But we need to do it by shifting, because medicine seems to have a certain sense the medical model seems to have failed. These people aren't coming into the system. From shifting to one of trying to treat illness to one of focusing on how can we create healthier behaviours or support people to self, better self-manage and self-care when they're experiencing poor mental health. And Big White Wall began in, a very, in very simple ways. It began by creating an online community where people were anonymous. And really, what that community did is what I think is one of the most fundamental things in how we apply technology to transforming healthcare, which is that we engaged in an exercise of co-creation. Digital enables us to co-create and that no longer means essentially having pe people in a focus group in a room. It means looking at the data every single second, minute, hour of how people are engaging with what is online and shaping it and what they need from it. And really, I, rather than talking about the detail of Big White Wall, I want to talk about a few design principles that emerged from that co-creative act that I think have broader applicability to digital health care not just mental health care. And the first and one of the things that seemed most important to people was that they had choice. Big White Wall emerged in an era where the very revolutionary uh, Improving Access to Psychological Therapies program emerged. I've seen one of, some people here that I know that have been involved in that, which is a fabulous program, but in its early days, I believe there was one solution, one about improving access to talking therapies, but also that it should be based on cognitive behaviour therapy. 
And whilst cognitive behaviour therapy suits a number of people, it does not suit all. There is no universal panacea. So Big White Wall began on a different principle, which is the community wanted choice, and not just of types of counselling, that they wanted to engage in a peer-based community, or they wanted to follow a course, or they wanted to condition track, or they wanted to be able to read something that helped them. And they wanted to choose radically. They wanted to be able to choose the therapist they work with, not be given one. And so that principle of choice really influenced how we grew the service. And most critically, from a survey we did early in 2007, the community said very, very clearly that about a large proportion, we knew it was around 25% of the members of Big White Wall were experiencing suicidal ideation and or self-harm. And they really, really felt that they wanted something more than peers, which is how we started working with the, a leading uh, mental health trust in the, in the UK, the, the Tavistock and Portman, to create a system of clinical facilitation. And we've used technology over the years that has meant that we only use clinical time as and when it is critically needed. And that's, I think, a very interesting model for putting healthcare online. So choice was really important to people. The second thing, which I think is, is really fundamental, is that the majority of people, I mean, 80% of people that were coming there said that their primary reason for coming to the Big White Wall service was isolation. As we know, isolation is, is, is a critical feature of, of, of poor mental health. And that doesn't mean you don't have family and friends around you. You just often don't share it, and you don't talk about it, and you actually suffer alone. So we introduced this principle of accompaniment that meant you are never alone except by choice. Whether you are connected with a peer, whether you are connected with content, whether you are connected with a course, whether you are connected with a clinician, you are never alone unless you make the choice to be. And over the years, we've increasingly driven that through data analytics so that we personalise the experience of people coming on Big White Wall and offer up content to them, Amazon style, that is most relevant to their needs and circumstances. We're in a constant process of learning about them and refining what they're offered. So accompaniment was a key principle. Then there was a the whole notion of disruption, which was disrupting from a looking at illness, but how you can develop skills and strategies for actually managing your own situation. And a whole, um, a whole range of services on Big White Wall, from following courses on, on how to manage anxiety through to working with smoking cessation that's highly comorbid with poor mental health, alcohol management, et cetera, et cetera, were set up to really place the center of control with the individual. Critical in any healthcare journey, that you as an individual have some sense of control, but absolutely essential with mental health care, where the usual experience is that you are removed any sense of control immediately. So disruption was a really, another really important one. Then was the whole notion of, <laughs> of outcome. Now this, you, you can kind of say, well, how can this be a, a design principle? Is it obvious that if you put something online, or in, you know, it's got to work? Well, the majority of people that have produced digital mental health apps don't seem to have heard this. If you followed any of the research studies, the one in Liverpool, the one that frankly brought the NHS, the first NHS apps library crashing down, the one that uh, the Harvard recently produced, a relatively small percentage of digital interventions pay any attention to evidence whatsoever and that what they're offering actually works. And to me, this is crazy. It's crazy because, you know, it's akin to me, I don't know what, standing in my kitchen and whipping up a new medication for diabetes, you know, a bit of bicarb, splash of limeade, and offering it to people in the streets and they're saying, how many people get sick this week? Oh, maybe I ought to just, you know, add a bit more flour. Or like self-drive cars, just saying, you know, well, we don't know if they're going to work or not. Let's just put them on the streets. And if there are millions of accidents, let's take them off again and do something about it. Actually, Volkswagen did something pretty... Oh, anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> so it's a whole notion of outcome. And for me, I have a research background. It's critical. If you are, don't care about whether it works, don't do it. And the f final thing, the design principle I wanted to talk about was around safety. And I don't mean safety just in a cyber sense, although that is absolutely fundamental. But for our community, the feeling that they were safe, as well as the fact that they were safe, was really important. And that is where the whole clinical facilitation model came into play. 
So Big White Wall does have real people 24-7, based in the UK, US, New Zealand, that are there to facilitate, facilitate the community. And most of their work is driven by data analytics. So we have algorithms running through Big White Wall where we've been able to correlate, for example, PHQ, PHQ9 scores for depression and GAD7 scores for anxiety with natural language use. So that as soon as somebody contributes 20 words of their story, and it doesn't have to be 20 continuous words, it can be 20 words in different areas of the service, we're able to predict with a great degree of accuracy what their PHQ9 and their GAD7 score is. And that enables us to do two things. One, it enables us to personalize what they're offered, so not everybody is offered the same thing. And the other is it enables us to risk stratify. And underlying that service, there are, there's a lot of science and a lot of good science. So one of the most brilliant uh, psychiatrists I work with, Dr. Richard Graham at the Tavistock, developed, for example, uh, and, and interestingly because his, his specialism was addiction, gaming addiction online, he developed 12 categories of, of risk. And so we were able to categorize people according to different types of risk category and develop protocols according to which they appeared to coincide with. So those principles of design have, I think, been highly effective in addressing the big numbers. We know that 50% or more of people coming to Big White Wall have not been to their GP or primary care doc. We know that for some groups, like the military, like serving personnel, that figure is 80%. And we all know the consequences of military personnel experiencing poor mental health who do not get support in the right moment and at the right time. And it's also shifted that paradigm from away from focusing on illness to developing healthier behaviors. Now recently, my attention has got caught by some new big numbers. And I'm about to launch a new company actually called Ammo. And these new figures that are really grabbing my attention are what I call a broader health perspective, which are teenagers. And as you might have guessed, I've got one at home uh, who actually said, Mom, if you're going to create another company, can it at least focus on my age group so uh, that we actually meet from time to time? <laughs> the big numbers here are shocking. Globally, 81%, 81% of teenagers do not get, take recommended exercise levels. 33% do not finish secondary education to any kind of helpful level. And mental health issues, in 50% of mental health issues, are formed by the age of 14. 14. So I've been looking at, you know, what kind of science can we bring and what technology can we bring to address those big numbers and effectively dress the future of, future of us. And there's some things that have come together me, for me. One of them is neuroscience, which I've become an absolute devotee of. And neuroscience says that from the teenage age through to the early 20s, your brain enters a, a second period of plasticity where new things, new patterns can be laid down and where they're easier to learn. But at the same time going on in the teenage brain, the frontal cortex is not, the lobe is not as well developed. So teenagers are more likely to take risks. And those risks could be to their benefit or their disbenefit in terms of their future health. And whatever they do will be embedded in terms of their own learning of habits, healthy or unhealthy habits. So neuroscience is really fascinating me at the moment. And I'm putting it together with behavioral economics and nudge theory, where I think there's a lot of really strong evidence that if you give a little nudge to a particular behavior and reward it, it's more likely to happen. So within the prototype of AMO, you have nudges, whole time evidence-based nudges that nudge people gently towards doing something healthier rather than unhealthier and rewarding them for it. And it also draws not just on neuroscience and not just on behavioral economics, but also on positive psychology and looking at how you get young people to embrace what is positive about themselves, which I don't know about you, but my teenage years were an unrelenting nightmare. 
was I right? Did I fit? Did I have the right clothes? Was I right things? How did you go on a date? What did you do on a date? What didn't you do on a date? And it seems now that you know, we have the technology to enable kids to be able to do these things. But so much that's developed for kids, again, is not developed co-creatively. So we are working co-creatively. And we've developed some design principles that are around mapping, measurement, matching, and motivation that run throughout the experience of ammo. I've now got, I was going to talk a bit about those, but I've got this light that's saying, your time is up. So let's just remember, if we're looking at applying technology to health, let's do it in ways that address big numbers, not small. Let's not move deck chairs around on the Titanic. Let's take on the big numbers that technology enables us to address. Let's shift the paradigm further away from focusing on illness and developing healthy behaviors. And most of all, let's find a technology that helps us match socks. Thank you.